at Andrews Ingle. I'm actually the head teacher of creative and performing arts, but I'm also um, the convener of the learning support team and have um, sort of worked with Sonia uh, and others to try and bring collaborative response into a fairly large school of about uh, a thousand students. Seven, to, seven up to 12, and we're a fairly new school. We're only a few years old, but we've already hit the demandables. We're growing and growing and growing. So um, yeah, they've, over the holidays, they've brought in new classrooms because we're, we're expanding. I work at Balna Coast High too. I'm the learning and support teacher. Um, I've been one of those for a long time. And Janet and I have been a working pair in a couple of schools now for a long time. Um, we kind of Kind of been hanging out over ten years, I think. It's, it's in a it's in a beautiful um, a beautiful part of the world. Even though I'm in Scotland at the moment, um, it, it's a it's a lovely a lovely area and a and a really diverse group of students as well, and and probably diverse teachers. People come from sort of far and wide to to work there. Some people come home and to work, and some people are new to the area, but. Lovely school, new facilities. Um, we have terrific kids and, you know, some of them are highly academic, some of them struggle. It's a massive range. So probably the challenge of your classroom teaching practice is just having that huge range of students in, in each class. You know, some of your seniors want to go to uni, some want trade, some just aren't sure. Um, yeah, so, you know, but that, that makes for, for challenging you know, challenging the way we teach so that we can engage everybody and not just the top or the middle or the bottom. We're, we're working with a lot of students with a lot of different need. And, and I think as teachers, that really pushes us. And we just really kind of wanted to um, make this happen in our new school. So Janet and I came to Canada for the first time, I think it was in 2016, was that, is that right? Yeah, um, yeah we were travelling around with David Townsend and he said to us, you should really meet my friend Curtis Hewson. And we were like, oh, who's this guy? <laughs> and so we, we met Curtis and we met him in a school and we got to see a collaborative response team meeting in action. And Janet and I were running learning and support at another school and we were like, oh my God, what is this? Yeah. Oh, we need that. And so we were at this other school and it wasn't wasn't really the right time or place to begin that kind of journey. And when we came over here, we're in a brand new, we're in the newest school in our state. And we're like, mm, maybe now's the time. We're in a brand new school with not many policies or procedures and everyone's being, you know, a little bit running around like a headless chicken. Now's the time. So we, we came back to Canada in maybe 2018. Is that when we came again? Yeah, I think and so. And we stayed with Curtis that time and we went to the your conference actually and we were inspired by so many of the leaders and teachers at that conference that we went, right, this is the time, let's do it. Yeah, there's been a real push in, in our education system, which I think has been more embedded in yours, but you know, that, that supporting all students is what we do as, as a part of our role, as every teacher, whereas previous to, to that for us, we were often subcontracting, like, oh, this student can't read well, so there has to be someone else that can help that out, or this student has emotional problems, but somebody else will help that. And and so classroom teachers were tending to subcontract a little bit and and not really deal with what was going on in their classroom. So that's that's really been the, the biggest change for us where, te where teachers are now going, okay, well, I, I, you know, I've got some strategies now. I know what we can do. These are the, the methods of support for students, but ultimately for, for in-class things. I, I'm over this. I can share ideas with other teachers. I can, you know, I can help engage all students or support all students. So it's been a really big cultural change, I think, in New South Wales, not just our school. And um, I think that makes it exciting. We all want to engage students. We all want to sort of switch them on and, you know, and, and help them to learn. And um, the, the collaborative response really helps that happen. And it, it moves the responsibility away from just you know someone in a learning support role or a support role 
to being everybody's business? Well, it's definitely lightened my load and it's certainly lightened the load of our learning and support team because those lower order adjustments are really taken care of in the classroom and by the classroom teacher now. And it kind of gives everybody a framework and a language to speak the same. So we're, we're, we're kind of all talking about kids in the same way now instead of everybody's got their own idea of what should be happening or what that's about. It's just kind of really connected everything, solidified everything. We're lucky that, that Janine Silcock is our, our principal. So she she's also been a visitor to, to Canada and, and, and understands collaborative response. And I mean, I, mean, I wouldn't say it's been an, an easy thing to bring into a school because there's there's been a reasonable amount of scepticism and what are you people up to and is this going to make my job harder or give me a greater load because you're you know you're trying to implement these strategies and and I think you know there, there was some reticence and some sort of reluctance initially but but what we're managing to do is build that sort of group of people that that are are becoming increasingly committed to seeing how it operates and, and going, you know what, this actually makes my teaching load easier. This this helps me, but more importantly, it helps the students. Also, so we were very, very aware that we didn't want to give teachers extra work or busy work or overwhelm them with more stuff because as a new school, we were incredibly busy and, and um, you know, there was a lot of change. So we we had to do a little bit of ninja style work on, on some levels and and really, you know, when things didn't quite work for us, things that we thought, that, you know, this is so obvious, why aren't people picking it up? We really had to be mindful of stepping back and saying, yeah, we need to have a bit of a look at that and go at it a, a different way. We really set up the foundation, like um, establishing that continuum of supports was absolutely paramount and how we communicated that continuum of supports, how we um, identified what supports were available. And then some people were aware of some of them, some weren't, and then all just kind of getting on the same page. I think that changed everything. Um, yeah. We have a thing in New South Wales, or well, in Australia actually too, called the Nationally Consistent Collection of Data. It's about collecting data on adjustments for students with disability. And for us, um, we do that every August. Every school in Australia does that in August and we submit them to the federal government. But one of the things um, that, that the collaborative response really helped us with that was to increase the amount of adjustments we were able to offer students and record them. So, so if a kid got an adjustment, say, for reading or, liter uh, or literacy or any type of adjustment, really, then, say, if I gave that adjustment in English, suddenly the maths teacher knows about it. We've got this continuum of supports that carries across every subject. Okay, so I'm the maths teacher. I didn't know how to teach the kid how to do that. But now we've got this nifty little document that you open up and you go, you don't have to admit that you don't know anything because the answers are all there. You can just go, oh, click, there it is. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I do that too. So kind of made it easy for everyone to just jump in with that. And we dressed it up under our um, legal responsibilities of the National nationally consistent collection of data. So that's something that we legally are required to do. And then to, to put CRM in as the support for that actually made both things work really well. We, we now work on, as a school, we work on four 75 minute periods. I think it means teachers spend more time with particular students. So there's no, there's not a lot of hiding and dodging. So when students are, are um, you know, exhibiting challenging behaviours, teachers really have to do something about that. I mean, they have to, to look more at, well, why is that a reaction to what I'm doing in class? And, and a lot of teachers, and I'm not going to say 100%, a lot of teachers have really started to look more critically at how they're presenting things in class, what they're doing with students in class, and then why they're getting the particular reactions that they're getting. And so... I, I think teachers are spending longer time with students rather than being rushed through 50 minute periods. So that, that was where I was getting at. 
it's our dream to embed that time. But in Australia, we have this thing where we have a lot of after school meetings and that's the norm. So we have our meetings after school. Um, we have them every three weeks. Uh, we have this kind of, I guess you'd call it a pastoral care system called HUB. So each teacher has a group of students, about 20, 22 students, so a small group. And the idea is that you keep those students from year seven to year 12 and you meet them for 20 minutes every day. So you really get to know them and their families. I have a year 12 group this year. I love them. I'm going to be so <laughs> sad when they leave. So, um, so all the year seven hub teachers will meet every three weeks. And then they talk about their referrals, they start to group their kids and they have like a mini learning and support team meeting or a CRM meeting that deals with those first two levels of adjustment. And they make a plan and then they communicate that with staff. So everybody knows what's happening for that kid. So every year group does that. So the hub teacher is, is someone that's making contact with home where it's needed, but making daily contact with the student. So those meetings, what we're trying to encourage those hub teachers to do is then refer on any students that are dropping off in attendance or really struggling with emotional stuff. Or maybe, you know, there's been a crisis or a divorce or, or there's, there's been some sort of pattern of behaviour that, that's unusual for that student. So we might be able to, um, you know, address the issue really quickly at a meeting. Oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll ring the parents again or we'll have a talk to the deputy or we'll, we'll see if we can resolve it at that level. Or if it's something greater and beyond that classroom level, then it moves up to learning support. So we're, we're really trying to embed more of a culture in those hub classes of, of teachers watching their, say, 18 to 22 students and and looking for what's going on with them. So Sonia's got a year 12 group. I've got a year 10 group that I've had since year seven. And I, you know, I, I like to think I know those kids pretty well. And I can, you know, they trust me enough to come to me for, for various things. Um, and I know them enough to go, mm, this, this looks like different behavior for that student. Mm -hmm. I'll check see what what's happening you know trying to then encourage those hub teachers to then come together as a group and look at particular students and that's you know that's that's been building we're certainly getting a lot better at that and and we're moving on now towards all right well no we're not you know because some of the the plight of those meetings has been oh well, I've got year 10 as a hub but I don't teach any year 10 students and it's like no 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 we're looking at strategies for students who drop off in at you know in attendance or who are having trouble with engagement or who who are having trouble with organisation and executive functioning etc. What what strategies can we do for for many students that go through that, not just an individual student? Which is I, that that's the bit that really excites me because instead of just looking at individual students, we're starting to share strategies for many students. I think that's been one of the biggest challenges with becoming such a big school and being a new school is staff, changing of staff, that yeah. every year so many new staff. Because, you know, in large schools, you only have X amount of time to deliver professional development. So we've found a, a lot that we're just, you know, bolting through that PowerPoint really, really quickly to try and show people and, and get them excited and and that's been exhausting because some people you know you, you can only pick up certain amounts of people doing that so that's that's been my biggest frustration but you have to listen to people saying oh, look uh, i'm still not quite sure what you guys are on about and yeah that that's I think been that was one of the strengths of li linking it to our legislation yeah yeah, is that it doesn't matter if you don't understand. You see, you've got to do it. Come and sit with me. I'll show you again. Let's yeah. go one more time. Can I show you one more time? What do you mean? Okay, let's look again. Show me again. How about I come to yeah. class with you for a while? <laughs> it was a challenge. Like we thought that everybody knew how to use the central information. Yeah. So we, 
you know that the, we've we've gone gung ho on things and then had to step back and go. You know what? A lot of teachers don't actually know how to make their way around this system, and you know because there's probably five or six different systems in in New South Wales that different schools use. So we had to sort of step back and go. You know what? People aren't completely au fait with how to get around this system. Yeah, so and I as yeah. we've implemented stuff, we've had to have lessons on how to use technology yes. and yes. the the infrastructure is, has been challenging we we just assumed everybody knew things but realized that no we're just nerds that kind of <laughs> 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 you're right some of our teams work really 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 effectively like the um the team sonia's on they're they're very very organized very systematic and their meetings work really well and some of the other teams Do you, you know, know why our meetings work so well it's because organized. we actually follow the system yeah. we follow yeah. the collaborative response meeting schedule we, we we follow everything so we basically took that yellow book and made it our bible yeah. and we we follow it and that's why i think our meetings are so quick because we got really good at it and that's why we're really good at communicating what our plans are where our kids are at it's it's really it's it just works when you do what the book says to do yeah and i think yeah some some of the other meetings you know people have good hearts and it and it's starting to get there um but what we've what we've put in place this year is during assembly time, instead of just the meeting after after time, during our assembly times, we'll be releasing particular year groups and then releasing people from, you know, the kind of core leadership team of CR and, and putting them into the meetings to sort of help kind of upskill people and, and let them know that it's not a laborious thing, it's actually a quick efficient system and and it doesn't have to take an hour it can be done much quicker and much more effectively so that's you know that's how we're going to try and and address that this year and um, I'm pretty positive about that I think that'll help sort of support some of the other leaders because you know the core even though we've got core people from our CR leadership team on each year group you know if they're not there then things sort of fall apart or if yeah so it's the it's, dynamics on the day of the team who's leading yeah. it that day yeah so yeah so we're really looking at kind of improving the quality of those meetings this year and I I think that'll that'll happen we've you know we've got committed people on each of the teams or several committed people on each of the year groups and I think um you know it it just needs practice. This year was a crazy year. You know, our first meeting, we were all ready to go and suddenly we went into lockdown and it was a Zoom meeting and half of the meeting, people, you know, participants didn't know how to do Zoom, me included. So, yeah, this year threw us a few curveballs, but the last couple of meetings when we came out of lockdown, meetings started to happen, you know, much more effectively. So I think we can pick up on that next year and well, hang on this year and um, really embed those practices and make it a, a super positive thing rather than something people are a little bit worried about. I think you're absolutely right on the practice thing though. Like it, at first it feels a little bit wooden. It's yeah. like, it's like I, I'm in this meeting and I'm a robot and these are, the, these are the systems that we use to support kids and I'm going to interrupt now. But, you know, um, once you kind of keep practicing it just becomes really natural if you can get over that wooden feeling and then bam it's just second nature and the preparation for meetings is is something we really want to focus on as well because often you know people turn up to to the meeting um oh, who are we going to talk about it's like, no you can't do it that way you have to know who you you know you have to know what's going on and be ready for the meeting and then it will be effective so yeah. A day or two before the meeting, we email out our agenda. And so then the hub teacher's got time to actually collect some information, even have a chat with the kid beforehand. So yeah. I think that yeah. that kind of helps us be a little bit more on the ball because we know who's coming up in our meeting rather than arriving on the day and going, oh, 
oh, oh, wait, I think I know something about that kid. <laughs> so. the, the preparation for meetings and sort of modelling that has really started to, to move and change. And we noticed, you know, when Year 11, which was Sonia's group last year, when they started to, we're talking about these students or these particular things, or there's a focus on attendance. Can you have a look at which students in your hub are dropping under 85% attendance? Things started to happen and um, yeah, that, that became a lot more effective. So yeah, it, it's extraordinary to step back and look, how, look at how many students we're now supporting. Whereas at the start of the year, it was this insurmountable mountain of students. Now, you know, it, it, it's pretty exciting that, that things are actually in place for so many of our students. Well, I can tell you that our um, nationally consistent collection of data submissions went up 600% in a year. <laughs> that means that 600% more students received an adjustment. Adjustment is something that people were a little bit nervous about. But when you start to break down a teaching practice, you can say, well, that, that that you do there is an adjustment or that's an adjustment. And people kind of go, Oh, really? I, I just do that. Well, no, it's a it's an actual adjustment. So you can let's record, record that. it. We made a nifty little checklist that we use to communicate our adjustments with now, um, just to so people know what you can do and what's easy to do. And they're all colour coded to our tiers and back to our NCCD levels as well. Those things have been incredible for creating a shared dialogue and for communicating which kids are getting what support. There is the, the cheat sheets that Sonia's created. Um, they've, they've been really useful. They're checking their literacy, their numeracy, they're looking at attendance, they're looking at you know, negative behaviours that are being recorded and people are starting to go, oh, okay, so this student has quite low reading level maybe that's why there's so many negative incidents you know that's that's probably work avoidance so how can those, we reduce that those data sheets have actually changed how I run learning support yeah um so for example at the end of last year I had a space in my numeracy intervention that only last could only go for 10 weeks I didn't want to carry a student over and so I, I pulled up that data sheet and I looked across and I was like well, who's high orange, but, but green attendance? Because I need them here every day. And who is good behaviour? Who's got green behaviour? Because I can't have them here stuffing around because I've only got 10 weeks. So I was able to choose from about five kids who fit those parameters very quickly. Another example would be, I had some kids who were sitting kind of in the red area for literacy, but and were also red for behaviour. And so I thought, oh, hang on. Well, let's pop them in a literacy program and just see what that does to their behaviour. And they didn't get out of the red, but they certainly halved their, be their behaviour entries just by participating in a literacy program and having daily contact with an adult. It, it's, it's pretty exciting to, to look at the number of students who are making improvement, but t raising teachers' awareness because they're divided in, you know, the students are divided and colour coded into the, you know, the different tiers for, for levels of need. But, you know, we're looking at students that are getting a, a lot of behavioural hits and a lot of, you know, getting into trouble in repeated subjects can, you know, quite, quite a pattern across many subjects. And then, it, you know, the interventions start to happen and, and we see that dwindling. And that, that's when you start to think, you know what, this is, this is working. These students are, are ma you know, they're making changes. Their teachers are making changes. They're more aware of that student's need. They're touching base with the student and the behaviours are, are reducing. And that's, that's been, like, as a head teacher, I can show my teachers those data sheets and you hear, you see people going, oh, now I understand why you know, that student's consistently late or completely disorganised or won't engage or gets cranky and walks out. I, I get it now. I, I now understand what it's like to be a student with really low-level literacy. And so 
um, that that dialogue for head teachers and teachers is is really really important because it then filters down to the student and rebuilds relationships with the teacher and students. So in instead of teachers taking behaviours personally and saying, oh, you know, it's bad student or they won't do my subject it's like all right maybe it's because you don't understand what we're oh the old can't or won't yes yes (laughs) i think one of the really interesting things about those sheets too is the conversation it's opened up whole school around what do we do with those stain line resistant kids quadruple red it doesn't matter i can pour all my resources into that and i'm not going to shift them yeah. What happens, it's really shown us, hey, who are our gifted and talented kids? What are we doing for these guys, my quadruple greens? And it's been really interesting to see the kids who score really high on literacy and numeracy, and you could assume that they were gifted and talented, suddenly losing interest in their attendance slipping into orange. Oh, wait, I haven't engaged this kid at all. What have I got to do? So there's all these other conversations that are happening not just about the bottom kids now. Yeah. It's how do I get those high oranges into green? What am I doing for my greens? Okay, the reds are always going to be there. We'll, we'll get to them. But there's this group of kids that we could lose at any time. It's, it's often overlooked, really. Oh, you're yeah. good. You're fine. We won't worry about you. You don't cause a problem. But now I know why. Am I extending yeah. you? Am I exciting you? What, wh- how are you learning? What's going on? They usually they're the, usually the kids who just leave quietly, aren't they? The, the data the data sheets or the cheat sheets as we call them, I think it's 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 really started to identify patterns with students instead of just saying, oh, that student's just disengaged. Well, you know, is there anything else we know about that? Have we, you know, have we what other data have we got? Can we triangulate and sort of work out some other reasons and and often it's, you know, things get, I don't, I don't want to use the word fixed, but improved for the student and then the, the teacher quite quickly. And that's, that's really exciting. So uh, we have state standardised testing. Um, so we use that data. Uh, most of our state de- standardised testing now occurs online and I'm always a little bit sceptical about what those results are and I like um, a face-to-face in-person test as well. So um, we take our state tests and then we compare them to our test that we do at school. So we do a PAT numeracy test. Um, we, we use LLI, so we benchmark the kids as well. So now we're comparing PAT numeracy to our state numeracy test we're comparing our LLI benchmarking to our state literacy testing. And then some kids, depending on what those probes look like, will have a NEIL or a YARC. Um, so that, that's our literacy and numeracy quick looks. Um, and then for we have a system called Central. It's like a giant database of every indiscretion somebody has ever made. <laughs> it's actually <laughs> awesome and terrible at the same time. Um, so I can run reports on that. So I usually pull off the data for each term. So we call them wellbeing entries, which is a little bit of a, a kind way of saying negative behaviour interactions. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, negative, the negatives are like five thousand entries, and the um, you know the positives much less so. <laughs> so I pull that off, and if if you if you're getting one a w- one a week or lower, you're in the green. I'm not worried about you. Everybody's allowed to do something once a week, aren't they? Twice a week, you know, I'm starting to maybe. So I usually give twice a week a bit of a go. Three a week and above, you're you're. Three to four a week, you're in orange. Any more than four a week and, you know, you're in trouble. And then I pull off um, our attendance data as well. So we have state mandated attendance. So 85% and above is, is green. But I actually think that if you're at 85 where the state says that you are, you're probably actually orange because it's only a small hiccup. So we, we like to shoot a little bit higher on that one. And so that's the data we're using at the moment. Uh, 
But we had a whole staff meeting when we were still allowed to have staff meetings. <laughs> Janet, the art teacher, made a beautiful triangle and we made it with all coloured wool on our pin boards in our staff meeting area and we gave everybody a ton of post-it notes and we started asking them to think about every adjustment that they would make for a kid if, what if, what if, what if, what do you do when a kid, what do you do when a kid, what do you do when a kid and so we had literally hundreds of these post-it notes that everybody did different and the same things when a, when a kid did a particular thing. Then we asked them all to swap them around. All right, now you take that groups, you take that groups, you take that groups. Now let's sift them into the right order. At what level is that one? What level is that one? So from that, we actually made the cheat sheet, the results of those thousands of post-it notes. And it was, it's probably worth mentioning, we're, we're an amalgamation of two schools. So two schools that were very, very different. So Ballina High School and Southern Cross. And, um, you know, each school then came to, to being one school, but still holding on to the various interventions that they had. And, and so it, it was interesting to look at you know, even what people thought an intervention was or what... Yeah, was that really, was interesting. That was really interesting. It was, it was Janet quite, and I sat there for a few yeah. hours going, uh-oh, uh-oh. <laughs> yeah. And, and people were probably most reluctant about putting classroom interventions in at that point, I think. I think people were really quite nervous about, you know, what is an adjustment I do in my classroom? That, that was probably... It, it was interesting that the the tier the quality teaching adjustments and uh -oh, the in class adjustments were the the least the the less confident I think yeah well pe you know pe people have, can easily say oh the breakfast club is an intervention or the chrysalis group is an intervention but those actual specific things they do in the classroom we really noticed there was a lack of a lack of confidence and. And so the adjustment checklists have, have really addressed that. And people are talking much more openly about what it is they do in classrooms to support engagement and learning and you know, particular student needs. And, and that's, I think that's been the biggest change this last year. Um, and bec you know, because of COVID, it meant that we had a lot more time to actually talk to staff and you know, be in small groups talking to your faculty about, well, what are you doing? Or have a look at this, or have you seen that? And it, it, the sharing process really sort of helped support a lot of teachers. There was a lot of, oh, I see what you're doing there. I think I could adapt that and, and do that in my class. So, you know, COVID has it, had its negatives for sure, but, but as far as teachers working together, it, it had some big pluses. People, the way that staff talk about kids has been one of the greatest rewards that I've experienced. To see people excited to talk about how they're going to help a kid instead of, oh, crap, what now? You know, <laughs> but to, yeah, that's what I've found really exciting. People rushing up, what are you doing? Oh, I'm doing this. And having the words to communicate with each other about exactly what they're doing, like, that, that definitely has been the best bit for me, that, that, that staff have really become confident in having those conversations. And I think that there are people, I mean, I know especially in my faculty, but, but also a lot of faculties, I think people are more positive um, and feel that there's something that they can do. There's, there's less of that negative, oh, you know, I'm just a teacher and these kids are bad. We don't hear that that anymore we we hear people really actively trying to problem solve and and share ideas and work out how they can make particular things happening in their classrooms better and oh yeah. I don't I tried that this didn't work maybe I should refer this kid to the team and people waiting for a response hey team you know about this kid how, how can I what can I do next like the excitement to yeah. ask for help is insane yeah. and what this is really decreased is that fear of sharing and teachers more and more are saying look 
I've got this going on in my class and I, I, I just, I haven't got the answers. I've tried a couple of things, hasn't worked. What, what would you do? So people are a lot more open rather than a few years ago. People didn't share their burdens because they were scared that, you know, you'll be put on a program because you're an incompetent teacher. And I, I know that sounds, you know, way bigger than it's supposed to be, but that's how people were feeling. They were a little worried. If I close my door, then it'll all be okay and I'll suffer through it. Where as now people are kind of going, oh, all right, so you're having a bit of a struggle with that as well. Let's, let's work think... together to see what we can do. Yes. You walk past classes and you see, you know, these students working really well and, and it's really easy to say to the teacher, what, what are you guys doing? Or what, what's, you know, what have, oh, well, this is what I've set up and this is how it works. And it's like, oh, well, that's a good idea. I reckon I can give that a crack. So, yeah, it's, it's been a, you know, it's, it's one, of the, one of the things about CR, CR that I love is that idea of, of um, you know, really thinking about your celebrations and your positives. And, and I think that's been a real positive for us is that we are seeing things changing and improving and it's improving for teachers, but most importantly, things are improving for students. Things are moving, they're moving in a really, really positive way. And we're actually a lot further ahead than we were, you know, a few years ago. So yeah, the wave of positive teachers that have come on board far outweighs those that are kind of going oh, you know nah, nah. like people are there's this groundswell and and I'm I'm pretty excited about that because it's it's going to keep building and you know the more that swells the more other people kind of go oh okay you know yeah this is this actually is a really good thing I can I can see how that helps we really want to engage all kids and make them happy and make school a really positive experience and that's our job and it's you know it's it's pretty exciting when uh, that starts to happen to leadership is so important like our principal encourages us to try things to experiment and we're allowed to fail um, we're allowed to just try things. Okay, so you tried it. Show me what worked, what didn't. What are we keeping? What are we chucking? It's that leadership that allows the passion. We, we want our organisation to be successful. We're not, and, and you need someone to support you to do that. We want our kids to be successful. What we're doing isn't always working and we have to try new things all the time. Yeah, so. Coming across to the conference a few years ago, I think that, that was really... Um, beneficial for us because we're we're a bit gung-ho and we want things happening really really quickly and listening to people saying you know this is our fourth or fifth year and this is where we're now going and this is how we're you know doing things was really exciting for us because it took the pressure off where we could try things and go all right we yeah, we got some people on board, but it is not quite working. I mean, we've still got three and a half years to go before we, you know, can, I think we'll be sitting back going, you know what, that was an absolute educational revolution in this school. And um, we've moved a long way in the time that we've had. And now we're just sort of, we're not slowing, we're just refining some of the things that we do and building confidence and capacity in teachers that's that's the thing we need to invest in you know there there's been a lot of things that have happened in our school where the the people have implemented it's been gung-ho it hasn't been sustainable whereas this is sustainable and that's you know that's how we've set it up and that makes me really excited because I think you know probably when we move on it will continue and that's you know that's that's a really cool thing it is kind of contagious too. Like even my collegiate are like, oh my God, what are you guys doing? Because it's incredible. I keep hearing and seeing how much this has increased and your kids are doing this and tell me about what you're doing. So it's it's a real, everybody wants to know. It's, it's really becoming outwardly obvious that what we're doing is working. Yeah. The feedback yeah. is so positive. You know, we're, we're nipping things in buds quicker than we, ever did before and um, you know it's multi-layered and and um, you know students are getting interventions that are really making a massive impact and difference on 
them much more quickly than I believe they were. You know, I won't ring that person's home, you know, student's home because I can see these people are doing this with them and it's all good rather than us tripping over each other because someone had done something fairly significant but it wasn't communicated to anybody. So improving those lines of communication has been quite a big difference this year as well. And it's, you know, teachers are busy, but it's really just saying, look, if, if you did something um, above a classroom intervention, then please put it on central so everybody knows. You've got, to, you've got to really do a lot of listening, which sometimes it's hard because you think you've got the answer. And at the same time, you kind of want to, you want to be a bit pushy with the systems and stuff we've set up. And they're like, oh, I don't know. It's like, have you tried? What? No. <laughs> Write everything down. Record your journey. Try and gather a team of supportive people who think the same way. Take it. You, you, Big ships turn slow is another one. <laughs> That's my mantra, actually. Big ships turn slow. I mean, we, we hopefully all come into education because we have a genuine interest in, in our subject, but in, in working with, well, for us, adolescents. And teenagers are really, really cool people, but they're incredibly complex and complicated characters as well. And, and it's really just knowing that you know, it's not about the content. It's about making connections. It's mm. about learning exciting and varied and, and trying to find ways to tap into students and to surround yourself, I think, with people who are positive, to, to surround yourself with, you know, people that want to make changes and, and want to make the best, um, you know, for every student in their classroom. Right? I think for getting involved in collaborative response, it's, it's, you know, come along to the meetings, have a look, have a listen, start to contribute as you feel um, confident enough because what you've got to contribute is really valuable. And I love, I mean, I, I have prep teachers, you know, early, early teachers all the time and I learn so much from them. So it's not about being, you know, oh, we're old and wise and we know everything. Everybody's got something to contribute. It's that experimenting thing too again, you know, doing what you've always done, you're always going to get the same response, aren't you? If you don't try something new, nothing's really going to change. Yeah. And don't be afraid to, to try different things, but don't, you know, don't don't be put off when things don't work the first time. Just sort of, you know, have another look, Be, you know, have a look critically regauge it have a go in another way like just keep trying and um don't you know don't lose the enthusiasm because going to work enthusiastic is uh you know <laughs> why wouldn't you <laughs> when when i first started at balna coast high we didn't have um many literacy and numeracy interventions and yeah they do feed into us so one of the things that i did early on was visit all the people in the same position as me in my primary schools because they would say things to me like oh not southern cross another one half of my students are below national minimum standards and i'm like i know because that means a quarter of my students are now below national minimum standards so what are we going to do to work together? So, so like, I, I want to honour your work. I want to build on your work. I don't want to start again. What have you already done? What worked? What didn't work? So Lee at Southern Cross and I worked really quite closely over a period of time to establish that continuum of support that follows those kids when they transition from year six into year seven. So Lee and I actually meet and are speaking the same language again. We collect the same data. Um, the kids just continue their literacy and numeracy support in exactly the same fashion now. We even run the same programs and support. We, we work pretty hard to make that happen. And I am one of my personal goals or my professional goals for this year is actually to pick up our next biggest primary school and try and do the same thing with them. Yeah. So it, it has been a thing and it, it did take a while. But as far as collaborative response and that goes, Lee and I have actually worked together on that as well and shared many of the same documents I've given you guys in um, the adjustment checklist, 
um, the specific training, how we linked our NCCD to collaborative response. So we're kind of following a very similar journey and helping each other along the way to make sure that, the, that those kids keep getting the, the right support. I mean, this this really is a, you know, a pretty revolutionary system for New South Wales education. And, you know, it, it takes time and it takes a lot of time to build and make resources that, that <coughs> suit our schools and our, um, you know, our students and, and our needs. So Sonia's done a, a mind boggling amount of work. Collaborative response actually really ties into my job as learning and support teacher. So it's really been my business the whole time. Look up, look up, look around, <laughs> see who's listening. Yeah. And those people who are all eyes on, there you go is, and you need to go with them. And those people who are who are who, who are like frowning at you, just just ignore them for a minute. You'll get them eventually. <laughs> and I actually the, the critical mass is is the people that you work with. We And we deliberately went to people that we knew would be on board and we sort of worked with them first. And like, I don't want to call it a virus because that's bad taste, but it, you've got to let it then spread across people who then, you know, share ideas with someone else and then you've got two people on board and then three and then four. So it... Um, yeah, it's nice to see that kind of ground groundswell of I think you guys call it buy-in, is it? You've you've got to be a little patient and, and wait for that to happen. And um, I think slowly, you know, we've we've got a lot of teachers really committed to the the cause. I mean, I'm not gonna say we've got a hundred percent because we certainly don't, but I think we have a groundswell of people who are now, you know, seeing the benefits and and really moving towards, yeah, this this is the thing that helps us out and it most importantly, it helps our students. We've actually got people asking to join the leadership team now. Oh, yeah. I could see the advantage of that. Uh, that'd work for my year group. Could I join that team? Yes, come on in. <laughs> and that's one, you know, you've just invited a leader of a team in. Well, the leader of the team takes that back to 12 people and goes, hey, guess what? We're doing this. They've just brought in four more people. Where that kind of ball of string they they show where what progress looks like. Well, you know we've we've had a, a massive acceleration up that little hill, and then we've kind of gone some steps back, and we've thrown our hands up and gone, "This is too much for the minute." And then we've, you know, come back, reflected, come back, had another go, and and we're seeing, you know, we're making our way up that mountain. It's 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 a long project. It's not a fix it in one or two years so change fatigue was massive for our staff and I you know you could see people just going you know another thing I've got to implement and remember so you know this this pe people can see this helps their teaching practice and I think that's um you know it's not more work it's a little bit of organization but it's it's work that actually makes your teaching much easier